Good afternoon. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is portfolio questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and answers. And at question number one, I call Jamie Halcrow Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce waiting times for patients with conditions other than COVID-19. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. The First Minister and I launched the NHS Recovery Plan in August last year in response to pressures on NHS services caused by the pandemic. The plan sets out key headline ambitions and actions to be developed uh, and delivered uh, now and for the next five years. This is backed by more than £1 billion of investment over the next five years of which uh, 80 million uh, this financial year alone has already been invested to support NHS boards to target the backlog of treatment and care. Uh, while it's important to stress that recovery and reducing waiting times for patients with conditions other than COVID uh, is the immediate task, the, the plan is fundamentally about ensuring that the recovery process delivers long-term sustainability and alternative pathways of care that allow people to be treated more quickly, but crucially closer to home. Jamie Halper Johnston. The Cabinet Secretary points to the NHS Recovery Plan, a plan that the BMA warned on its release contained worrying gaps, and one that little progress was made towards in the months before the Omicron variant emerged as a significant concern. In many areas, the pandemic has not created new prog prog uh, problems, but exacerbated pre existing issues. Weekly AE figures are the worst on record. We are seeing continued poor performance for the 62 days standard from urgent suspicion of cancer referral to first treatment, and almost 60,000 people have been waiting on treatment or diagnostic tests for over 12 months. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how long it will take before the delays and backlogs are meaningfully tackled? And does he accept that while there may be more NHS staff than before, demand is also higher? So how will the Scottish Government tackle these backlogs without piling considerable additional pressure on existing staff? Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Jimmy Halcrow Johnson, look, he is in danger genuinely of being uh, or of denying the impact that COVID has had. I'm not saying to him that there wasn't issues or challenges or problems pre-pandemic. Of course there were, but it would equally be ridiculous if somebody suggested that the pandemic hasn't had a major impact, not just a slight or marginal, but a major impact on the NHS and the services uh, it, it provides. Uh, so, in terms of our NHS uh, recovery plan, uh, he'll, uh, I won't rehearse all of the targets and ambitions within that plan. But crucially, of course, we intend to increase NHS capacity by at least 10 per cent in order to address the backlog uh, of care. We will increase our funding to the NHS and, of course, uh, for the next financial year, it will be a record settlement of above £18 We will continue to ensure that we have record staffing within our NHS and we will continue to make sure they are the best st paid staff in the entire uh, UK. And crucially, and I said this in my opening answer, we want to ensure that there are appropriate alternative pathways that allow people to be treated as closer to home as possible. Neil Gray. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And getting access to treatment, obviously primary care, is of fundamental uh, importance. And the Health Secretary will be well aware of the challenges currently being faced in NHS Lanarkshire, driven by demand and staffing pressures, which has resulted in NHS Lanarkshire scaling back it's some of the services being provided by GP practices. I'm reassured that that's been reviewed on a weekly basis, but, uh, and also the conversations that I've had with the Health Secretary about this situation. But I wonder whether the Health Secretary would be able to update me on any action that the Scottish Government has taken to try to support NHS Lanarkshire, the GP practices in particular, to allow uh, these services to be returned as quickly as possible. Cabinet Secretary. I say to Neil Gray uh, that I thank him for raising uh, this issue with me directly, and I am hosting a meeting with Lanarkshire MSPs from uh, across political parties uh, on Monday alongside uh, the Health Board. I spoke to uh, Andrew Buist, uh, Dr Andrew Buist, uh, from the BMA today around that issue uh, in relation to access to GPs. It's fundamental, it's crucial, uh, and uh, we have where we, we, where, where we can, we will absolutely support staff uh, across the NHS. For example, uh, he will be aware that there is an exemption that allows staff to return if they are close contacts of somebody who has tested positive. Uh, that required a PCR or negative PCR test. Uh, I have removed that requirement upon clinical advice, and that again should help with that staffing issue. So there is not one single thing that can be done, but lots of things that we are doing that is helping uh, with that staffing issue. And I can give him an absolute assurance that NHS Lanarkshire in particular uh, is a health board that we have very regular engagement with. Jackie Bailey. 
Waiting times were already a significant problem before the pandemic hit. Indeed, before the pandemic, 450,000 people were waiting. Now it's gone up to 650,000. One of the Royal Colleges told me that one significant barrier to catching up on these waiting lists, certainly for operations, is that there simply isn't the space within our hospital settings. So in addition to creating capacity, what consideration has the Cabinet Secretary given to utilising spare theatres such as those at the Vale of Leven Hospital? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a very good question and an important point by Jackie Bailey. It's some work we're doing uh, centrally uh, within government to see where we possibly have theatre space, where we potentially have nursing and medical and, doctor, uh, and, and, and clinical staff, and how do we marry them all together. Some of that work has been done, uh, absolutely. Uh, the Golden Jubilee, of course, plays a crucial role in talking to the Golden Jubilee on a regular basis about how we maximise their capacity, but she's absolutely right. There's other uh, acute sites there where they may have the theatre space, but not quite the clinical staff. So that work is absolutely uh, ongoing, and I'm happy to continue to keep Ms Bailey and members updated on that. Question number two, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it will release its plans for the reopening of minor injury units. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, to be clear, there's not any uh, national policy of closing uh, minor injury units throughout the pandemic. The majority of MIUs have remained open, uh, but I know in some health boards, uh, NHS Grampian, for example, units have closed temporarily to allow staffing to be allocated to areas with the greatest needs, such as COVID, COVID assessment centres. I should also say uh, we don't have a specific policy in the provision uh, of minor injury units in communities. We leave local health boards to make those decisions at a local level uh, and, and, and advise my clinical, uh, clinical advice to ensure everyone can continue to get the right care at the right time this year we have invested £23 million towards the redesign of urgent care. Uh, under this new approach, NHS 24 is now available 24-7 for those who think they need a &E services, but their illness is not life-threatening. Uh, through this service, people may be offered a virtual consultation, receive care closer to home, or indeed receive a scheduled appointment during a safe time at A&E. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, the Turriff Minor Injuries Unit provided an essential service to the local community. Indeed, without it, Turriff residents have to travel long journeys to already crowded A&E departments. Constituents have raised fears to me about the long-term future of the Turriff Minor Injuries Unit, which was shut temporarily 20 months ago. Can the Cabinet Secretary commit to the reopening of the Turriff Minor Injuries Unit and give a timescale for my constituents, who have been deprived of easy access to health care? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say to Douglas Lumsden, obviously I'll, I'll leave these decisions to be made locally, but I will raise them, of course, uh, with the Health Board. But his central point is absolutely correct. Uh, if we do not have minor injury units open, people will, one, have to potentially travel further. But secondly, they'll go to sites, acute sites that are already under pressure and already busy. So I, I can completely understand and agree with his rationale and his reasoning that minor injury units uh, should remain open where possible. And in the vast majority of health board areas, uh, they are. But he is right to raise this specific issue, and I will raise it in terms of the health board, and I will update uh, the member on those conversations. Julian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Figures published yesterday showed that for the week ending 9th of January, only 60.4% of patients attending a &E in NHS Forth Valley were seen within four hours. I want to give my thanks to all staff who continue to work immensely hard to try to improve this. Given the pressure being placed on a &Es, has consideration been given to reopening a minor injury unit within Forth Valley Health Board? Cabinet Secretary. I'm, I'm sure consideration uh, has been given, and again, I speak to Forth Valley uh, on a very regular basis, and I know uh, Gillian Mackay does uh, also, uh, and she and I had a conversation before Christmas uh, around the specific challenges uh, in relation to Forth uh, Valley. Uh, although Forth Valley is absolutely challenged, uh, I should say that I would expect improvement to be made, uh, and while I obviously uh, wouldn't comment on next week's figures uh, until they're published, uh, we know that the week ending the 9th of January was particularly pressured because of high staff absences, uh, because of COVID occupancy, and indeed because of the accumulative effect of the pandemic over the last 22 uh, odd months. But I can give her an absolute assurance that I know Forth Valley are uh, leaving no stone unturned to better that performance. And uh, I would expect them to continue to uh, ensure that local members are kept updated on that improvement plan. Question number three is not lodged. Question number four, Alexander Burnett. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the care inspector in its role of inspecting and assessing care homes. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> oh, my apologies, Minister Kevin Stewart. <laughs> I could have answered it.
Uh, thank you, President Minister. Uh, my officials and I are in regular contact with the Air Inspectorate to discuss a range of strategic issues, including inspections and resources. Under the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010, Scottish ministers are also required to approve the Care Inspectorate's annual scrutiny and assurance plan, which underpins their activity and is reviewed regularly. In 2021-22, the Scottish Government provided the Care Inspectorate with an additional and recurring budget of £4 million to meet resource pressures. Alexander Burnett. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Now, the number of inspections to care homes has decreased by 41% from 1,372 inspections in 2016-17 to just 812 in 2021. And this decline was happening even before the pandemic. Now, following Storm Arwen, it's come to light that a number of care homes and assisted living sites did not have adequate resilience planning, something which would have been picked up by inspections. So does the Minister agree that the reduced resilience is a direct result of a decrease in the number of inspections? And what actions will you take to rectify this? Minister Kevin Stewart. Um, thank you very much, President Officer, and I'm uh, keen to hear from Mr Burnett the detail of uh, those resilience matters, and if he wishes to write to me, I'll respond accordingly. Uh, but during the early stages of the coronavirus outbreak, uh, the Care Inspectorate, with the agreement uh, from Scottish ministers, uh, took the decision to scale down inspections, recognising inspections may put an unnecessary burden on the care sector, could uh, have also contributed to the spreading of COVID-19 and put their inspectors at risk. Um, this reflected the position of other UK and Irish regulators. However, this decision uh, has been criticised, um, but it was the right thing to do. Uh, On-site care home inspections resumed in May 2020. During the pandemic, it has not been possible for the Care Inspectorate to inspect all adult care home services in the conventional way. Instead, the Care Inspectorate has adopted a more targeted, intelligence-led and risk-based approach to service inspections. And this approach has prioritised on-site inspections of care homes for older people and services where immediate risk is identified. Paul Keane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It was reported last week that a third of Scottish care homes are now restricting visits due to high prevalence of infections in communities and the uh, interpretation of a managed outbreak by public health authorities. Relatives, however, feel that with a correct testing regime and protective measures in place, that visiting should be maintained in line with guidance. Some indeed have called for the care inspectorate to take on a key role of checking that testing is robust, comprehensive, timious, and publicly reported on in inspection reports provide confidence and keep homes open to visitors. As we move forward, will the Minister look at this role for the Care Inspectorate in monitoring and reporting and ensuring that homes remain open to visitors? Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, President Officer, the Care Inspectorate are already uh, looking at homes uh, where visiting uh, is not what it should be. Uh, and I would like to thank the Care Inspectorate for the help that they have given uh, government in these regards. I am very hopeful um, that changes to the PHS guidance, which uh, uh, it will be issued today, uh, will make some differences in terms of ensuring um, that relatives have access uh, to their loved ones uh, in care homes. And as always, uh, President Officer, I am uh, very keen to hear um, from members where there may be difficulties so that we can follow up that along with colleagues in the care inspectorate in order to get it right for relatives and the residents of care homes. Question number five, Russell Findlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to extend financial support for PPE in the social care sector. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, President officer, social care providers can claim back PPE costs over and above their usual amount. In 2021-22, uh, sorry, 2021 £862 million pounds has been allocated to help with costs arising from COVID-19 and has demonstrated our commitment to supporting the sustainability and resilience of the sector. 
a decision will be taken in due course about all financial support measures for social care providers post-March. Support is also available to social care providers, including unpaid carers and personal assistants through local PPE hubs for emergency PPE supply. Uh, we are working with NHS National Services Scotland on how best to supply PPE over the longer term. Russell Finlay. Thank you, Minister, um, for the commitment. Um, this is only one of the increased costs facing the sector. Um, will the Minister heed concerns and ensure that it is fully funded for the true cost of care through the renegotiations re on the National Care Home contract? Minister. Uh, the Government is not involved in the negotiation of the National Care Home contract, President Officer. Um, that is a matter um, for uh, COSLA um, and the care providers. It is they that make the decisions around about that, not Government. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to ask about access to FFP3 masks in social care. And can I ask the Minister, have risk assessments been carried out by employers if FFP3 masks are not routinely provided? Are these dynamic assessments and reflect increases in the levels of COVID transmission? And are individual assessments available for those staff who consider themselves at risk? Minister. Uh, President Officer, uh, winter respiratory guidance was published in November, uh, which sets out the appropriate PPE to use in different circumstance, circumstances. And all of that is in line uh, with the WHO guidance. Uh, PPE guidance is developed by infection prevention and control experts on a four nation basis. The UK IPC cell is responsible for providing advice and guidance in relation to PPE requirements and IPC measures uh, more generally. Uh, if Ms uh, Bailey requires further detail, I am quite happy to respond accordingly. But we are uh, following and have updated that guidance. Question number six, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its discussions on social care provision in Fife. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We are in daily contact with health and social care partnerships and continue to closely monitor the ongoing impact of the pandemic and the challenges that this brings uh, to the social care sector nationwide. Health boards and health and social care partnerships have provided assurances that people in need of the most urgent care and support will continue to receive it and that its delivery will be prioritised. The Scottish Government Adult Social Care Winter Preparedness Plan sets out measures to address social care provision in all local authorities, including Fife, and outlines how we will support those who use services, the workforce and unpaid carers. Annabelle Ewing. I, I thank the Minister for his reply. And whilst I well understand that responsibility for the delivery of social care services lies with Fife Council, NHS Fife, and of course the Health and Social Care Partnership, given the very great challenges in Fife at this time, notwithstanding the tremendous efforts of our frontline uh, social care staff, can the Cabinet Secretary advise as to what help? the Scottish Government can offer so that all those who need special, uh, social care get the services that they are entitled to, and that on a timely basis. Minister. Um, I thank Ms Ewing for her question, and I know that she has been uh, vigorously pursuing this. She asked the Cabinet Secretary at uh, the last question at time uh, whether we thought that folk in Fife were straining every sinew um, to deliver for people locally. And I think that that is the case, uh, having talked to um, the Chief Officer of the Health and Social Care Partnership on Monday, uh, who has said that this has been the most strenuous um, three weeks in her career. I believe that staff are doing uh, all that they can. Uh, in terms of government support, NHS Fife was allocated £7 million um, from the additional £300 uh, million of winter funding that was announced on the 5th of, uh, of October. And that included £2.7 million pounds for interim care and £4.2 million uh, pounds to expand um, care at home capacity. Um, uh, Fife, I know, are ensuring 
uh, that that money is spent wisely, uh, and uh, I know uh, that they are doing their level best. Uh, we fully appreciate the problems local partnerships are having in providing social care at this time. The Deputy First Minister uh, convened a special meeting yesterday uh, with local council leaders and health board and local authority chief executives, uh, along with representatives from the third sector, to identify further ways we can support the social care sector, including the social care sector in Fife. We will continue to have those discussions, we will continue to monitor, and we as a government will continue to do all that we can to support the social care sector across Scotland. Willie Rennie. Yeah, the Minister really should not be satisfied with the assurance that those with the most urgent needs are getting addressed, because there are many people every single day in Fife who are not getting important and essential visits. They are missing out on meals, tuck-ins and medicines. So is he going to realise that this is an issue that has been building up for years and we should no longer take carers for granted? We need them, we need them now, and we should start paying them properly. Minister. Uh, President Officer, we recognise that uh, there needs to be support in the social care sector. And in terms of the issue of pay, uh, we have announced uh, two pay increases funded by the government over the past few months. Um, I think we have uh, a way to go in terms of pay and conditions. Uh, and one of the reasons why I am so keen to say a national care service is so that we can uh, have the national pay bargaining and set, bargaining and set the right conditions um, for folk in the sector. I, I agree with Mr Rennie um, that you know, there are folks out there uh, who are not getting the level, levels of care that they had uh, previously. Uh, but we are at the most precarious stage in this pandemic uh, with uh, COVID cases. Uh, glad to see them reducing, but still a number of COVID cases. Um, with folk off, with winter pressures, um, and uh, it would be fair to say that staff are tired too. Uh, I know that Fife are doing their level best. We will continue to support them in any way that we possibly can. The discussions between uh, government and health and social care partnerships as I say, continue on a daily basis. Uh, we will do our level best to ensure that we support them to the utmost, and I know that they will do all that they can to support uh, the folks in their communities to get the right care. Question number seven, Pam Gossel. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the support that it is providing to the reported increasing number of people with long COVID. Cabinet Secretary. We continue to implement the 16 commitments contained in our approach paper that is backed by £10 million of a long COVID support fund. We have launched a long COVID information platform on NHS Inform that will help people to manage their symptoms. And we continue to support clinicians to access evidence-based information and advice to inform assessment, assessments, investigations and referrals. Uh, and, and lastly, the NHS National Services Division is establishing a strategic network, bringing together clinical experts, NHS boards, but most crucially, uh, those with lived experience to support the ongoing development, resourcing and implementation of services for people with long COVID. Pam Gossel. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for this response. In September 2021, the Scottish Government earmarked £10 million to a long COVID support fund. Four months on, what improved or better coordinated services are now in place to care and support for the 100,000 Scots suffering with long COVID? And why has the government decided not to invest in dedicated long COVID clinics? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank Pam Gosso for recognising the investment that the Scottish Government has made. It is crucial, it is important, it is going to help, of course, uh, when it comes to the development of our long COVID uh, response. And that is developing, because we are, of course, continuing to learn more and more about long COVID uh, as time goes on. That is why we, also take, uh, we, we have also uh, just taken the decision to invest uh, in research, which is as important as well as the practical action uh, that I have outlined in our framework outlines. Uh, what I would say uh, to, 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 to Pam Gosso is uh, there is nothing, of course, stopping NHS boards from developing long COVID, uh, long COVID clinics, such as, for example, uh, the Hertfordshire model, which I think she and other colleagues have referenced before. So there is no barrier to doing that, but to suggest 
or to allude to the fact that long COVID clinics are the panacea, are the solution uh, to, to, for those who are suffering from long COVID, uh, I think would be misguided. So we let health boards take the approach that works for them locally. And of course, we're proud to have invested, uh, or please, I'm pleased that we have invested £10 million. Uh, and I'll continue to, 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 to take, take a personal close eye and, uh, and close attention to this issue. And if there's further resourcing that's required, of course, we'll continue to explore that. Question number eight, Liam MacArthur. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the date by which self-referral for over 70s to the breast screening programme will resume. Minister Marie Todd. While programme capacity remains challenging due to COVID-19, the pause on self-referrals allows appointments to be prioritised for women aged 50 to 70. However, I recognise the anxiety the pause is causing, and I have asked officials to accelerate consideration of restart options, which would not unduly impact appointment times for the eligible screening population. This will not be easy. Any decision will be informed by clinical advice and the ongoing pandemic. In the meantime, if anyone of any age is concerned they may have symptoms of breast cancer, they should immediately make an appointment with their GP practice. Liam MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that response? With cancer diagnosis rates down during COVID and an overall uh, rising trend in the incidence of cancer, many women in my constituency have been concerned about their inability to self-refer for breast screening. As the Minister knows, Orkney is one of the areas reliant on mobile screening units turning up every three years. So does she accept that as the screening service returns to pre-pandemic arrangements, there's a case for looking at what more might be done in places like Orkney to ensure those who need and wish to have an opportunity to be screened? And can she also confirm there are no plans to move from a three-year to a five-year cycle for screening? Minister. So I fully understand the concern of the women in Orkney, and I can assure everyone that women who live on islands will not be forgotten. Work and options to restart will consider impacts um, on those who rely on mobile screening solutions, whether on the islands or on, on the mainland. In terms of the um, review um, of screening frequency and screening age, all of those decisions are guided by the UK Screening um, Committee. So they'll be looking at evidence. Um, I'm not aware of a change to five-year screening, but um, should they come forward with that recommendation, we would be inclined to accept it because it was, would be based on clinical evidence. Um, so the UK um, Screening Committee look at all of the evidence relating to the screening programmes and give guidance on a four-nation basis, basis, and all four nations do tend to follow that guidance. Thank you. I regret that as we're over time. I cannot take any further questions. There will be a small, short pause before we move on to the next portfolio. Thank you. The next portfolio is Social Justice, Housing and Local Government. And uh, if a member wishes to request uh, a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or indicate uh, so in the chat function by entering the letter R. I call question number one, Willie Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is tackling inequalities and child poverty in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Uh, thank you. Uh, tackling child poverty is a, a national mission for this government, and we're making considerable investment to increase family incomes and reduce household costs. In 2020-21, we spent £2.5 billion in targeted support for low-income households, including nearly a £1 billion to support low-income families with children. 
and this year, through our Scottish Child Payment and Bridging Payments, we will put around £130 million directly into the pockets of low-income families across Scotland, including in the members' constituency to those who need it most. Uh, we will further increase the support available to families by doubling the Scottish Child Payment to £20 per week from April this year. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that detailed answer. At the Local Government Committee on the 11th of January, we heard Unison joining with the Tories to, come to, to claim that the Scottish budget would do nothing to reduce inequalities in Scotland. Can you confirm that the Scottish Government has spent £594 million mitigating the budget cuts imposed by the Tory Government on the poorest people in Scotland, with £83 million paying for the bedroom tax alone, and that we will continue to fund child support payments expanding the school clothing grants and free school meals in my constituency, and that these measures are just a few examples of how the SNP government is directly tackling child poverty and inequality in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I can confirm that, and I can also confirm that the 2022-23 Scottish budget uh, continues significant investment to tackle poverty and inequality and strengthen public service in services, including more than £3.9 billion towards benefit expenditure, uh, providing support to over 1 million people in Scotland. Uh, we are also investing £831.5 million towards the delivery of affordable housing, as well as £65 million for employability support and the first £50 million of the whole family wellbeing fund. And we will continue to fund the expansion of free lunches and provide meals during school holidays to the children who, meet, who need them most. And I will take a supplementary. Uh, I note that the question relates to child poverty in Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley. However, I note also that both the questioner and the Cabinet Secretary have widened out the subject matter. Supplementary, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Only one in four eligible children will get the £20 rate of Scottish child payment. 170,000 of those children won't get the new rate of £20 because they're on bridging payments, and 125,000 children won't get anything at all. These children also need the extra money too. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out whether she will double the bridging payments for these families? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we, as Pam Duncan Glancy knows, we had this exchange at the committee uh, that I attended uh, last week, and I said to her that we are fully committed to rolling out the Scottish Child Payment to under-16s by the end of, of 2022. Uh, and until full rollout, we'll continue to deliver the uh, innovative £520 a year bridging payments, which make use of local authority data uh, to deliver immediate support to un around 150,000 children at a cost of £78 million a year. We have gone as far as we can with the doubling of the Scottish Child Payment to £20 from April 2022. But, of course, if Pam Duncan Glancy or anyone else wants to discuss amendments to the budget, then I am sure that is something that we can discuss. But, of course, they would have to show where any additional money would come from elsewhere in the budget. Question number two, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to help residents in flats that have unsafe cladding. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we are committed to ensuring the safety of people in homes with unsafe cladding. We are progressing with our single building assessment and cladding remediation programme, which of course is free to home owners. 25 high priority residential blocks of flats have already been selected for the initial phase of the programme. Inspections are underway and we expect the first completed report soon. We expect that the majority of buildings will be shown to be safe. Where issues are found, then we will seek appropriate solutions to remediation and urge other parties, such as developers, to play their part. Graeme Simpson. Well, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? We have been pressing the Scottish Government to take action on this for years, and they have failed to do so. Thousands of Scots are trapped in unsafe flats with little hope of ever selling them. Last week, Michael Gove put developers on notice in England. They have got two months to agree to a funding scheme or measures could be put into law. What is happening here? Clauses in the Building Safety Bill will allow the UK Government to introduce a levy on developers of high-rise buildings. What is happening here? And finally, why is it that flammable cladding has still not been banned in Scotland? It has not. So when will it be? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I just say that is quite a misrepresentation of the position. The single building assessment, the single building assessment process. Excuse me, Cabinet Secretary, could you resume your seat for a second? I don't want all this shouting from a sedentary position. We want to hear the answer from the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. 
Please resume, the Council. single building assessment has been an innovative approach that is actually being looked at by other parts of the UK. And our assessments, of course, will help to understand the scope and scale of the cladding issues across Scotland. As I said, to reassure people, the majority of buildings we, uh, will be show, shown to be safe, but where issues are found, we will seek the most appropriate uh, solutions to remediation. And of course, we do want other parties, such as developer, developers, to continue to play their part where construction is found to be unsafe. The member mentioned Michael Gove. I have written to Michael Gove, the Secretary of State for Leveling Up, but I have yet to receive any detail on consequentials in addition to the £97.1 million. I will continue to press the Secretary of State for details in relation to the original £3.5 billion announcement made in the UK Budget in February uh, last year and in relation to the additional £4 billion announcement on the 10th of January, uh, which we were only notified about on the day of the announcement itself. We welcome the, uh, the announcement about making uh, developers pay, but we need to see the detail of what that means for the Scottish budget, because we need to go beyond the £97 million, but we need to know what those resources are that will be coming forward. And we will continue to make the progress that we are making through the innovative single building assessment. And I would have thought that was something that members across this chamber would welcome. A supplementary, Eleanor Whitam. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has just actually answered the question that I was going to ask, but I'm going to repeat it. Can you advise us what updates the Scottish Government has had from the UK Government re um, with regards to the consequentials that they have promised that we are expecting um, to take this work forward? Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I, I think uh, just a very brief answer if you feel you've already answered that question. Well, uh, as I said, I'm happy to keep Parliament appraised of any response we get from Michael Gove and the UK Government, but it is important that we can give certainty for the remediation programme beyond the £97 million that we've already committed. But I can say to people that we are absolutely determined to progress with the single building assessment, uh, get the, the works underway and done, but we need the UK Government to give us clarity on the funding that will be available beyond the £97 million. And supplementary, Willie Rennie. And this is a Scottish Government responsibility, and the Minister must understand that flat owners across the country are deeply anxious at the snail's pace that this Government is moving at. When are we actually going to get some progress on this so we can give the flat owners the assurance? What is the date by which this is going to be done, and what funding is going to be forthcoming from the Government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I don't know if Willie Rennie heard my first answer, but I told him that there is already underway the 25 high-priority residential blocks of flats, which were the pilot for the single building assessment, so that we can see what the scale of remediation is likely to be across Scotland. As I said in my initial answer, those inspections are underway, and we expect the first completed report soon. I would have thought when we are actually getting on and doing something that other parts of the UK are looking at because it's a good model that that would be welcomed. I'm as keen as anyone else in this chamber to make that progress, but they are very specific and complex engineering projects that are having to be taken forward. When we get those completed reports, I will be happy to keep uh, Parliament updated about those. Question number three, Mary McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its welfare policies have supported people in employment who have been impacted by COVID-19. Minister Ben McPherson. We have a wide range of support available for people in, in employment and on low incomes. Uh, this includes the majority of our social security benefits, our five family payments, discretionary housing payments and the £500 self-isolation support grant. Uh, local authorities have awarded 56,317 self-isolation support grants, totalling £28.2 million between October 2020 and November 2021. Our Scottish Welfare Fund has also provided almost £63 million to around 60,000 households since March 2020 to help those on low incomes. And by uh, October 2021, uh, around 530,000 households had received our £130 low-income pandemic payment an investment of nearly £70 million to assist people in need. Mary McNair. I thank the Minister for that response. Does the Minister agree that the level of statutory sick pay set by the UK Government at one of the lowest rates in Europe has been found wanting during the pandemic? Will the Minister join me, the STUC and anti-poverty groups in calling for an increase in statutory sick pay 
that ensures it gives the necessary financial support to those unable to work due to COVID-19 and other health conditions. Minister. I would absolutely agree, and uh, because employment law is reserved, we will continue to call on the UK government to increase statutory sick pay to match the real living wage. Uh, earlier in the pandemic, the ca then Cabinet Secretary for Social Security wrote to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, uh, asking for the UK government to make statutory sick pay uh, more responsive. Uh, and in September last year, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy wrote to the Chancellor, asking for him to consider uh, the closure of the statutory sick pay rebate scheme uh, to reconsider it rather. Uh, and so uh, we are in agreement that the, the current level is not fit for purpose and we will continue to make this point to the UK government at appropriate opportunities. Uh, thank you. A supplementary, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. One of a few positives to come out of a pandemic is a flexible working from home has become more mainstream, which suits many disabled people. Will the Minister commit to engaging with employers and reporting back to Parliament in how we can continue to foster this inclusive working style post-pandemic while taking into account issues of isolation, loneliness and social participation? Minister. I thank Jeremy Bar for, for raising those important points and I would agree with the, the sentiment that uh, was, was behind his question. If I may, I would like to uh, take that suggestion away and engage further with Mr Balfour and uh, finance and economy ministers uh, to consider the points he raises in. Question number four, Donald Cameron. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will support local authorities to make decisions on local services based on local priorities. Minister. Uh, local authorities are independent corporate bodies uh, with their own powers and responsibilities. The Scottish Government has committed to supporting councils with a finance settlement of over £12.5 billion pounds in 22-23. And this represents a cash increase of £917.9 million, pounds, or 7.9%, uh, which is the equivalent of a real terms increase of 5.1%. Donald Cameron. Analysis by SPICE shows that almost 18% of budgets for local councils are ring-fenced for Scottish Government initiatives, a steep rise from just 4% in 2018-19. Can the Minister confirm why ring-fencing has increased by over four times in recent years? And does he acknowledge that this reduces the ability of councils to deliver services based on local needs? Minister. While uh, ring fence funding is uh, for increased investment in services such as our schools and nurseries, uh, local authorities also have uh, autonomy to allocate 93%, uh, that's £11.6 uh, billion pounds of the funding we provide, uh, plus all locally raised income. However, uh, the Scottish Government recognises that local government have repeatedly called for the removal of ring fencing uh, in the settlement and a greater focus uh, on trust and partnership working. And on that basis, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy, Kate Forbes, has committed to reviewing uh, all ring-fenced funding as part of the forthcoming uh, resource spending review. Uh, and we would welcome uh, constructive engagement from local government uh, in that process to ensure that the removal of any ring fencing goes hand in hand with our shared priorities and outcomes, uh, whilst, of course, also ensuring maximum value for money. And supplementary, Neil Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Social Justice and Fairness Commission that I had the pleasure of, de of being Deputy Convener of reported last year and re recommended an increased use of participatory budgeting in local government uh, to ensure that local people had a greater say in their local communities, had greater local accountability and felt that their communities reflected their needs. Is that something that the Scottish Government would support an expansion of? Minister. The uh, Scottish Government uh, certainly does support participatory budgeting as uh, one mechanism uh, to involve people in decision making. And from a constituency perspective, I have seen uh, really significant uh, the significant success of uh, participatory budgeting in uh, the Leith Chooses initiative. Um, our national participatory budgeting uh, support programme has enabled over 122,000 voters uh, to have a direct say on the dispersal of more than £6.6 .6 million. And we will work with the National Petitionary Budgeting Strategic Group 
uh, who have produced uh, the framework for the future of participatory budgeting in Scotland, uh, with a particular focus on health and wellbeing, education, housing and climate change. And we will continue to, to work with them in that regard. Question number five, Sue Weber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans to build 110,000 affordable homes by 2032. Cabinet Secretary. Scotland has uh, led the way in the delivery of affordable housing across the UK, and I'm proud of our record of delivering over 105,000 affordable homes since 2007, and we remain committed to our target of delivering 110,000 affordable homes by 2032. Uh, to support that aim, our draft budget increase of £174 million for affordable housing brings investment in 2022-23 to £831 million and total investment across this parliament to £3.6 billion, meaning we can continue the important work started in 2007 of ensuring that everyone in Scotland has a warm, safe and affordable place to live. Sue Webber. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Affordable housing is particularly important in Edinburgh, where the average house price has now surpassed £300,000 for the first time. But affordable housing statistics published last week show that only 822 affordable homes were completed in Edinburgh in 2020-21, a drop of over 35% on the previous year. Homes for Scotland have warned of flaws in the City of Edinburgh's City Plan 2030 and say it will not be able to meet the housing demand in the coming years. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary whether the Government will step up investment in affordable housing and can she guarantee that councils such as Edinburgh will be able to access the grant funding they need in order to meet local housing demand? Cabinet Secretary. Well, let, let me say a couple of things about that. Uh, Edinburgh will benefit from investment of uh, £233.8 million towards the delivery of more good quality affordable homes, an increase of over £32.4 million on the previous uh, five years. Um, the member talked about the, the progress under over 2021. 20, uh, I would just point out that uh, during that time, of course, um, the affordable housing uh, programme was uh, hit by the pause in uh, non-essential construction uh, during the 23rd of March to the 10th of June. Clearly, uh, construction then resumed in a safer, slower way in line with social distancing guidelines. But of course, uh, that will have had an impact on the pace of the delivery of affordable homes, whether it's in Edinburgh or anywhere else. And I'm sure the member uh, and most reasonable people listening to this would understand that. However, uh, the progress is picking up again. And as I said in my initial answer, we are determined to make the progress on the delivery of affordable homes in Edinburgh and elsewhere. I would just make the point that the government's per capita spending on affordable housing is more than three times higher than the UK government. So we will continue to prioritise the delivery of affordable homes, which is in stark contrast to the government south of the border. A supplementary, Ariane Burgess. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what work is underway with local partners regarding the 11,000 of these homes which are secured for remote, rural and island communities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, with uh, £3.6 billion pounds of funding in place this Parliament, we're working closely uh, with partners to plan the delivery of affordable homes in rural, remote and island communities, while our demand-led Rural and Islands Housing Fund is supporting community groups and others not able to access the main affordable housing supply programme. And of course, we've committed to develop a remote rural and islands housing action plan informed by a wide range of stakeholders, including community representatives, as this will be vital to ensure that it delivers for more remote rural and island communities. A supplementary, Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Rent payments are the single biggest cost for many households. Year-on-year -year rent increases from social landlords squeeze already stretched family budgets. Can I ask what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that affordable housing is truly affordable? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I just first of all give my personal welcome back to, to Ruth Maguire, uh, to, to the Parliament. Uh, it's great, great to see her here. Um, we have a, a clear interest in housing association rent affordability and even more so given the pandemic, which we know has caused hardship for many and has increased living costs. Individual social landlords are legally required to consult their tenants 
on any rent increases and strike the best balance between rent levels and meeting the housing needs of, of local communities. The Social Housing Charter requires landlords to take account of what current and prospective tenants are likely to be able to afford, and the Scottish Housing Regulator monitors rent levels and rent affordability. We are considering how to build on the strong work already put in place around rent setting in the social rented sector as part of the rented sector strategy currently being consulted upon. And lastly, we have committed to develop a shared understanding of housing affordability, which is fit for the future and takes account of the real cost of housing. Question number six, Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to provide homeless accommodation in rural communities. Cabinet Secretary. Providing a, a suitable home for everyone is at the heart of our Housing to 2040 strategy, and we're providing local authorities with investment of £53.5 million over 2018 to 24 to tackle homelessness and move people as quickly as possible into settled accommodation with the right support. Communities will also be supported by the continuation of the Rural and Island Housing Fund, backed by £30 million of investment in this parliamentary period. We have committed to delivering 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, of which 70 per cent will be for social rent, 10 per cent will be in remote rural and island communities. Evelyn Tweed. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Many constituents in my constituency cannot access homeless accommodation in rural areas at all and are having to move into the city of Stirling, remote from work and family support. How will the Scottish Government support councils to provide homeless accommodation where it is needed? Cabinet Secretary. Um, so, as I said, 50, over £53.3 million pounds of resource planning assumptions has been allocated uh, for Stirling Council's affordable housing supply programme for five years up to 2025-26, and we're providing up to £30 million pounds this Parliament for the demand-led rural and island housing fund. Um, as I said earlier, we are developing a, an action plan for remote rural and islands housing, and uh, Stirling Council has received over £430,000 to develop and implement their rapid rehousing transition plan between 2019-20 and 2021-22, and will receive an allocation of £132,000 for 2022-23. This funding helps prevent homelessness and provide settled accommodation to homeless households. And supplementary, Mercedes Vialba. Thank you. Last year, there were over 27,000 households assessed as being homeless in Scotland, while 47,000 homes valued at £8 billion lay empty, including in rural areas. Compulsory purchase powers are no use to councils without fair funding. I welcome the Scottish Government's Housing's 2040 proposal to establish a new fund for local authorities to bring empty homes back into residential use. But can the Minister confirm by what date the fund will be ready to receive applications from councils and how much the fund will make available in its first year of operation? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are determined to bring as many empty homes uh, back into operation as possible. And of course, the empty homes uh, officers that have been working in local authorities to identify uh, empty homes have been doing uh, a really good job. I am happy to keep the member informed once we are in a position to uh, announce the beginning of the, the Empty Homes Fund and the, the, the time frame that it will be uh, working to and the amount of money that will be in it. I'll keep the member uh, updated. Okay, I have two more questions on the Business Bulletin. I'd be keen to take both uh, and would appreciate succinct questions and answers. Question number seven, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on whether all homes are on track to comply with the new fire safety regulations by February. Cabinet Secretary. These regulations were introduced to protect lives and property and to bring owner-occupied and social rent properties into line with the private rented uh, sector and new build homes, and we would encourage everyone to install them. As the regulations are not yet in force, information will be collected in the next Scottish House Conditions Survey. As we have constantly said, the legislation says that work should then be done within a reasonable period, which takes into account individual circumstances, and no homeowner will be penalised if they are unable to do the work. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for her answer, but see, I think it is pretty shocking given that the regulations were delayed by a year because of lack of publicity about the regulations and the pandemic. If the Minister can't tell me how many homes are now compliant, could she at least tell us how many people have received financial support from the fund that was allocated 
uh, given the cost of installing fire alarms and the fact the Scottish Government underestimated that cost of installation to meet the regulations in people's homes? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, I will go on in my statement that we'll come on to shortly to outline the publicity that has gone on around this issue and indeed the awareness that is out there. And I'll go into some detail around that in my statement. In terms of the, the support to people, we have uh, put out £1.5 million to Care and Repair and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to support those who might have struggled, or homeowners who might have struggled uh, to put uh, these uh, appliances uh, in place. Um, I think from the, the most recent figures, uh, around I think 2,000 people have been supported in one way or another through the care and repair service. But again, I will go into more details of that when I come to my statement. And question number eight, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many families in the Kirkcaldy constituency have received a new Scottish child payment. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we do not publish statistics on Scottish child payment by constituency. However, we do have data at local authority level which shows that just over 8,700 applications from clients in Fife had been approved for Scottish child payment between the opening for applications in November 2020 and September 2021. These figures are based on the most recently available official statistics, which cover the period up to the end of September 2021 and are published quarterly. Doubling the payment to £20 from April 2022 underlines our commitment to deliver on the national mission to tackle child poverty. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Child Payment has made a huge impact already on doubling of payments, so that the Scottish Government is committed to using the limited powers it has to tackle child poverty. As we look ahead into 2022, can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the Scottish Government will provide further financial support to people with a rollout of new devolved benefits? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I can tell uh, the member that we are committing over £3.9 billion for benefit expenditure in 2022-23, providing to support to over 1 million people in Scotland by March of next year. And this includes doubling and extending the Scottish Child Payment, which is forecast to benefit 334,000 children by the end of 2022, and our new low-income winter heating assistance, which will guarantee a £50 payment to around 400,000 low-income households from next winter, replacing the UK Government's personal independence payment with a new adult disability payment from next summer, benefiting around 20,000 people in 2022-23, rising to over 400,000 in 2024-25. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions. Uh, and uh, before we move on to the next item of business, uh, can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the chamber and across the Holyrood campus.